Why the heck am I talking about specificity, recall, precision, and here's why. Ignoring it now will make your journey much tougher along the road. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we are talking about performance evaluation in the context of machine learning and AI. It all boils down to statistics, which forms the foundation layer of data science, machine learning, AI, you name it. If you are looking in the long-term career, don't overlook statistics. Ignoring it now will make your journey much tougher along the road. But if you are feeling overwhelmed with the amount of information, take a breather, let's revisit the basics together. In this video, I will explain the common performance evaluation measures and answer which one is the best and why. This video is based on my blog post on Medium, which became really successful. So here I'm excited to share it with you guys today. Remember to hit the like button if you enjoy this content. And don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments below. Your feedback is always appreciated. So let's get started. The whole point of performance evaluation is to know how the model performs in the real world. Depending on the kind of data we are dealing with, there are two kinds of predictive modeling, classification models and regression models. Classification models predict discrete value. These may include classes and labels such as cats versus dogs, mushrooms versus flowers, etc. Regression models predict a value based on continuous data. This includes sizes and amounts of something such as rental prices, weight, etc. Here I will talk about classification models, which are used to compare predictions with the real or the true classes. Based on the number of correct and incorrect predictions, we can evaluate each model. And for this, we need to introduce something which is called the confusion matrix. Generally speaking, a confusion matrix is a table with rows and columns representing the instances of a predicted and actual class or vice versa. In this animation, you can see the elements of confusion matrix. This matrix encompasses the information of the performance of our model and the type of errors that are being made. So it's easy to see if our model is confusing the predicted classes or not. That's why it's called confusion matrix. As you can see, there are four cells in this table representing the four main elements. PP, which stands for true positive, PN, true negative, FP and FN stands for false positive and false negative respectively. True positive happens when the true and predicted labels are equal. Both are positive or yes. True negative happens when both labels are equal as well, but they are negative or no. At the same time, false positive and false negative happens when there is a mismatch between the true and predicted label. And to understand this better, let's talk about this whole thing as positive or negative. Statistically speaking, positive or negative are not related to good or bad news. So they are used to describe different types of values or outcomes. Positive refers to something that exists or is present, while negative refers to something that does not exist or is absent. For example, so you can understand them better. In the classification model, positive might represent the presence of certain characteristics or the occurrence of an event, while negative represents absence or non-occurrence of such characteristics or events. It's like saying yes or no to a specific question. If someone is positive for some disease or if that apple or pear is spoiled or not. I hope it makes sense. Uh, if not, give me a shout out in the comments below. So now we can start mixing and matching these four elements from the confusion matrix and get our performance evaluations. 
the first performance evaluation metric is called accuracy, which is defined as a number of correct predictions, which are true positives plus true negatives, made by the model over all kinds of predictions made. Here is an equation. The higher the number of correct predictions made by our model, the higher the value of accuracy. Uh, mathematically speaking, a larger numerator leads to a larger function, right? So, is it a good measure of performance? It depends on a dataset. Accuracy is a good measure when the target variable classes in the dataset are roughly balanced. For example, if we have a dataset with 55% of birds and 45% of fishes, then the accuracy value of the model, which is classifying this dataset, makes sense. Otherwise, I will give you now example where imbalance dataset completely disregards accuracy as performance. Metric. So, for instance, if we have uh, from 100 images, 95 of them are images of birds and only 5 images of fishes. And we developed an algorithm that performs really poorly and whatever image you give it, the output will be garbage and it will always say this the bird, which will show 95% accuracy, right? Sounds cool. But in fact, it would completely ignore all of the fishes in the images. So because of such disbalance between the number of images of birds and uh, fishes in our dataset, we cannot trust accuracy as performance evaluation metric. So let's look one step further into something which is called recall and precision. Recall or sensitivity, uh, which is defined as a ratio of true positives to all the correct predictions in your dataset, where false negatives are included here because they are actually the correct predictions too. Uh, here is the equation, and the higher number of false negatives, the lower the value of recall. Mathematically speaking, the larger denominator leads to a smaller fraction. Again, the answer highly depends on the task at hand. Let's take an unfortunate but realistic example related to the current or previous situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. If we misidentify affected by the coronavirus patients as healthy, we increase the false negative error. If we misidentify healthy people as coronavirus affected patients, we increase the false positive number. In this case, the cause of false negative is higher than the cause of false positive because for every false negative case coronavirus will continue to spread while for false positive it doesn't. Uh, hence in this case we need to identify every COVID-19 infection. We need to eliminate the false negatives and ideally make them zero so we aim for a perfect recall where recall is equal 1 or 100%. In other words, a highly sensitive model will flag everyone who has the disease and not uh, generate many false negatives. Precision metrics, which is defined as the ratio of true positives to all the positive predictions by the model, which is similar to recall, but is uh, exactly the opposite. Basically, the higher the number of false positives our model predicts, the lower the value of precision. Again, mathematically speaking, a larger denominator leads to a smaller fraction. Is it a good measure of performance of the model? Similar to the recall, it highly depends on the task at hand. Let's talk about a less depressing example, where we want to identify an email as spam or not spam, right? So uh, here in this example, if we misidentify an important email as spam, we increase the false positive error. If we misidentify a spam email, as important, we increase the false negative number. So in this case, the cost of false positive is higher than the cost of false negative because every false positive case will make us miss an important email while we can deal with every spam email false negative manually. So in this example, we want to get every important email, even if we will get some spammy emails along the way as well. So we would aim for a perfect precision, precision of equal 1 or 100 percent if we need to be more confident about true positives. So what's better, precision or recall? 
It really is unfortunate that improving one reduces another. In other words, reducing false negatives increases false positives and vice versa. But in order to properly evaluate a model's performance, we have to examine both precision and recall. But what if we want to get an optimal value of both of these metrics at once? Then we should talk about the next metric, which is called F1 score. Mathematically speaking, F1 score is the harmonic mean between the precision and recall. What is great about the harmonic mean is that it provides balance between recall and precision. So a classification model is considered ideal when F1 score is equal 1 and complete failure when F1 score is equal to 0, which is amazing because it ensures that we would minimize both false predictions, false positive and false negatives at the same time. Again, is it a good measure of performance? Of course, in general, F1 score is a better metric in the real world than accuracy, for example. But it's worth repeating that accuracy doesn't make sense if your dataset is imbalanced. In contrast, the F1 score is highly affected by poor recall or poor precision, making it somewhat sensitive to false predictions, also in case of imbalanced dataset. So, here is another performance evaluation metric alternative to the F1 score, which is called the Area Under the Curve, or AUC in short. If we come back for a moment to the confusion metrics, we can squeeze out another important metric, which is called specificity. Specificity is a ratio of true negatives to all those that are correctly identified as not having the condition by the model. As you can see, the higher number of true positives, the lower the value of specificity. Mathematically speaking, again, a larger denominator leads to a smaller fraction. A really easy way to think about specificity is something opposite to sensitivity, but it is different from precision. So if I didn't confuse you completely, in this way specificity is the fraction or portion of observed negatives that were predicted to be negatives. Even simpler if we think of specificity as a fraction of negatives that are correctly identified, then a perfect specificity corresponds to a perfect precision. Whew. Is it a good measure of performance? Again, the answer really depends on the task at hand. If our task to identify true negatives or alternatively eliminate all of the false alarm, then specificity is a good performance measure. The difference with precision is that Specificity tells us how correct our predictions in terms of the negative confirmation, such as how many healthy people did we predict out of all healthy people? Why the heck am I talking about specificity, recall, precision? And here is why. As I mentioned that F1 score might not be ideal performance measure, so there is another performance evaluation metric which is called Area under the curve, or AUC, and it is defined as a metric for performance evaluation of a classifier, which is equal to the probability that a randomly chosen positive instance will be ranked higher than a randomly chosen negative one. Oh, but wait a moment, what area am I talking about? So the curve is called a Receiver Operating Characteristic, or ROC. This is a graphical plot that illustrates the diagnostic ability of a binary classifier system. And as you can see from this figure, ROC is nothing more than a figure representing a true positive rate against the false positive rate. In other words, sensitivity against 1 minus specific specificity. In other words, sensitivity against 1 minus specificity. Points above the diagonal line represent good classification 
classification result better than random and below a diagonal line, a bad classifier. As a rule of thumb, people usually use the following values for the model evaluation. Excellent between 0.9 to 1, good between 0.8 to 0.9, fair between 0.7 to 0.8, poor 0.6 to 0.7, and failure anything below 0.6. So how to get this ROC? As seen in the in this uh, animation, the different values of the decision threshold produce different values of true positive and false positive rates. Higher values of threshold C produce lower values of these rates and vice versa. The actual ROC curve is drawn by connecting different points on that graph. And is it a good measure of performance? Again, it depends on what we want to do with our model. Get an absolute value of its performance or compare it with a different model. The most important thing to understand is that we cannot treat the outputs of AUC curve as the likelihood. Such as having a model that AUC is equal 0.8 does not mean that the model is 80% accurate. So AUC curve outcome is not directly comparable to the precision, recall, accuracy, or F1 score. Instead, AUC is good for comparing the difference between two models, such as which of them outperforms another one. In other words, it tells us the rank of the prediction without its absolute value. For example, it's good with ranking the customers based on their possible response to a particular advertisement. But AUC is not good measuring the actual model's performance, such as absolute value or error. For example, with uh, spam email filtering. Another point of the AUC is that it outputs a quality of the model's prediction for any given value of the th threshold, even if we do not want that. These two features of AUC measure are called scale invariance and classification threshold invariance. So, to sum up, is area under the curve is a good measure of performance classification or not? I would say that it is great for binary classifiers, but it is extremely difficult to generalize for multi-class classifiers. It's worth to note that uh, there is an alternative measure of area under the curve, or AUC, which is called Gini coefficient. And the Gini coefficient basically normalizes the AUC score so that a random classifier scores 0 and a perfect classifier scores 1. The range of possible Gini coefficient scores is from minus 1 to plus 1. And uh, mathematically, Gini coefficient is defined as 2 AUC minus 1. And in general, a good model has a Gini coefficient above 60 to 70 percent. This is just an alternative measure to AUC score, so the above mentioned conclusions are direct applicable to the Gini coefficients as well. So we are um, moving to the Jacquard index for similarity. The Jacquard similarity or Jacquard index is defined as the size of the intersection of the predict and the true labels divided by the size of the union. And basically perfect Jacquard would be equal 1, while the worst would be equal to 0. And it is used to compare a set of predicted labels for a sample to the corresponding set of labels in true dataset. In other words, a similarity between two objects. So, is Jacquard index a good measure of performance? So, uh, if your goal is, for example, to compare two text documents in neural language processing or NLP tasks, or two images in object detection tasks, or even to find similar customers via recommendation systems such as Netflix, the Jacquard similarity is a good measure. Here is an out of my head a short example of applying the Jacquard index. Suppose uh, we have two sets or lists of names. List A contains apple, banana, pear, watermelon, and list 
B contains melon, cucumber, apple, lemon. So how similar are these two sets? So let us apply the above mentioned equation to figure it out. So intersection would be one, because we have only one uh, repeated word, <laughs> that is apple. While the union will be seven, because there are two sets, and uh, bear in mind that apple is accounted only once, because a union doesn't account for repetitions. Finally, uh, the checkered score would be in this case, intersection divided by the union, one over seven, which which is 0.14. So this score is quite poor, but it makes sense because these two lists had only one common element. No wonder that uh, Jacquard index is so low. So I hope this example uh, clarifies uh, the usage of such index. And let's move on to the logarithmic laws. A logarithmic loss is such performance measure evaluation that penalizes the incorrect or false classifications. Here is an example, as you can see, and it is impossible to calculate the log loss for a classifier without assigning a probability to each class, in contrast to simply outputting the most likely class. Log loss varies from 0 to infinity, but this score shows a loss of a model, hence the closer it to 0, the higher the prediction accuracy, because the smaller the loss, the higher the accuracy. Hence, to minimize log loss would be equivalent to maximizing accuracy of the classifier. We can even account for the imbalanced data by adjusting the the probabilities in a way that probabilities are proportional to the number of classes. Basically, log loss is more accurate than accuracy. Is it a good measure of performance? Log loss is good and even better than F1 score for a class prediction that is based on probability. For example, suppose we have two models which predict the same class label with different probability, such as model 1 predicts with 55% probability, while model 2 predicts the same class with 80% probability. In this situation, F1 score would give equal weight to both models, but log loss would give more weight and preference to the second model. Here's an interesting thing. In reality, if both of these models are confident in the wrong class, we should penalize the second classifier more because it has more confidence in its wrong prediction. Similarly, when both models predict the correct class, second model should have a lower loss because it has more confidence that is right in its own prediction. If I have not confused you enough by now, uh, let's answer this question. What performance evolution metric is the best? The answer might disappoint you, because there is no perfect, the best evolution metric for all cases. But there is a better one for each specific case at hand. It depends on the data set and on what we want from our model. So here is the truth that nobody remembers everything all the time. And the most important thing is to know about the existence of such performance evaluation metrics and then come back to them once in a while to refresh them in your memory. And I hope this video was informative and useful and if you enjoyed it, give it a like and subscribe to my channel to stay up to date with this in upcoming videos. And good luck in your data science and AI journey. Finally, you can find the link to the blog post in the description box below. See you next time.